Good day, Grade 12. Sorry about that. There seems to be a, been a bit of a mission with the um, transmission of the lesson, but let's get started straight away. We are doing physics in preparation for your exam on the 10th, which if today's the 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, that's Thursday, hey? You guys are writing chemistry, all right? Wait, no, physics, physics, sorry confused you're writing physics on Thursday and then you're writing chemistry like a whole week later okay right and these questions have been taken out of the IEB um, papers so you guys should be ready and rearing to know be able to do them um, and we're going to get started immediately with going through these um, okay so the first thing that we need to do is we need to read the question um, and the first question says flying bat emits sound waves of a frequency of um, 75 hertz okay so that's the sound that the bat is actually emitting it is 75 hertz okay so now what we need to look at is the fact that a stationary observer detects the um, frequency of the sound waves emitted as 73 hertz. Um, okay, so what does that tell us? What do you think that tells us? That tells us that the thing is coming towards us or going away. Let's think about it. Remember that we said that if it was coming towards us, the frequency would be higher. And if it was going away from us, then the frequency would be lower. Do you remember that? So we've got to think about what is happening. Because the frequency is lower, then we know that this is Going to be going away from us. It says the speed of sound in air is 340. So it says state the Doppler effect in words, guys. I'm not doing this seriously. Okay, so parent shift in frequency um, observed. Okay, it's so the parent shift of frequency when there is motion between the source of the sound or visual effect and the observer okay is the bat flying towards or away we've said away now it says plucked at the speed at which the bat is flying okay so we know that it's going to be f of the observer equals v plus or minus v of the observer over v plus or minus v of the source frequency of the source. Now that formula is on your formula sheet and it's exactly like that. The tricky bits are to work out what information we have and whether we're going to use plus and minus. So we know the frequency of the observer is 73 hertz, okay? We know the frequency of the source if it's 75 hertz. The observer is not moving, he's stationary. So V of zero is zero. And V of S is what we are trying to work out, okay? So therefore we've got the frequency of the observer is 73 is equal to V, oh sorry, and V degree is 340, they gave it to us. It's the speed of sound in air. So that's 340 over 340 and then plus or minus Vs and then multiply by 75. Now let's think about this. We want this whole thing when multiplied by 75 to give me 73. So do you agree my denominator has to be bigger than my numerator so this has to be a plus. Okay so that's how we work it out. So now we need to solve for Vs. So the first thing we can do is we can divide both sides by 75. So this cancels with this, right? So now we've got 73 over 75 is equal to 340 over 340 plus Vs. Do you agree we can then do a little bit of cross multiplication and we can go, well, 73 multiplied by 340 plus Vs I'm cross multiplying is going to equal to 340 
multiplied by 75. Then I can divide both sides by 73. I can cancel, that gives you 73. So now I've got 340 plus Vs is equal to 340 multiplied by 75 divided by 73 is okay and now sorry is equal to and then what we're going to do is we're going to subtract 340 from both sides and we're going to go v of the source is equal to 340 multiplied by 75 over 73 minus 340 which equals okay so now let us get out a calculator there we go and find out what that works out to be so let's clear it shall we um clear. okay so we're going to go three let's use a fraction 340 multiplied by 75 divided by 73 then we're going to go minus 340 equals. Okay, so that gives us 9,32. Because remember, this is science. So we always round off to two decimal places. That's so 9,32 meters per second. That's so 9,32 meters per second. Okay, now it says, briefly explain the observations that enable scientists to tell that a universe is expanding. So basically what you can explain about here, it, what they're really wanting is about the redshift, okay? So what you need to explain is that when they observe light, let's just do this, when they observe light that is coming from stars, they notice that the light is being redshifted the light is being redshifted so the, what they do is they observe the stars let's say this year the light from the stars and then what they do is they observe the light from the stars next year okay and what they're actually doing is looking at the spectra of the elements that are being burnt in the star so in other words when you look at your light you will get a spectrum okay and let's say the spectrum is giving off light like this so let's say it's red and then maybe a little bit of orange red orange yellow and then maybe a little bit of blue okay just let's pretend okay then what happens is that um, they look at the light again next year okay from the same star and when the star is giving off light it gives off a spectrum or well, they can send the light through a spectrograph to look at the spectrum and they will notice that the light that is giving off will be giving off a spectrum that looks like this now so it'll be exactly the same spectrum but it's now going to be shifted slightly over to the left hand side of the right hand side it's shifted over to the red side so therefore we can say oh look this has been right a shift it's been red shifted the light has the, the light that is being coming out has been red shifted the red shifted means that it moving away from us and therefore we can say the universe is expanding okay two applications of the Doppler effect it's important to realize that you can't just say we can use it for fetal detection okay because it's not used for fetal detection you can just use normal ultrasound for fetal detection okay but what they do do is they can use it to look at the heart rate of a fetus of a baby okay in utero or they can even look at the blood flow you can look at the rate at which your blood blood rate the rate at which your blood is flowing okay 
And the whole point about this is, is that the Doppler effect looks at the parent shift in frequency due to the motion, okay? So we can look at the heart rate or the rate at which the, the uh, fluids are flowing to the baby and back, but or we can look at the rate at which blood is flowing inside your um, arteries to make sure that you're actually getting um, the blood flowing properly um, and that you don't have a little bit of a, a, a gap that is too small in your arteries and that is all to do with flow. So if you are taking any, setting any two applications of Doppler effect, especially in medicine, do not just say, oh, it can see if the baby is there or not, or oh, it can see if your blood's flowing. That's not what it's for. It's actually to look at the rate of the baby's heart or the rate at which the blood is flowing. Right, now we need to do some electrostatics. It says three charges, Q1, Q2, and Q3, carrying charges of positive, where is it? Positive two times by 10 to the negative five. That's interesting. This looks like a six and that looks like a five. We're going to say 10 is negative five, okay? Um, coulombs, minus two times by 10 to the negative four and positive two times to the negative four, respectively, are positioned as shown in the diagram. Okay, so state Coulomb's law in words. Coulomb's law in words is basically F is equal to K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. So what it's saying is the force between two point charges is directly proportional to the product of their um, charges and inversely proportional to the distance between the center squared. There, done. That's Coulomb's law. Now it says draw a diagram that shows electrostatic forces exerted on Q1 by Q2 and Q3. Okay, so Q1 is experiencing some forces, okay? It is going to, it is positive year and negative year. Do you agree? So Q1 is feeling attracted towards Q2. So this is the force of Q2 on Q1. It's being attracted, okay? It is being repelled by Q3 because Q3 is positively charged and Q1 is positively charged. So it is being repelled. So this is the force of Q3 on Q1. Okay, done. Now it says calculate the net electrostatic force exerted by Q1 by Q2 on Q1 by Q2. So what we need to do is work out that force, work out that force, and then work out the resultant. So we can work out the resultant pretty easily by just realizing that we can do a head-to-toe diagram, or we can look at the parallelogram method. Doesn't make a difference. This is the force of Q3 on Q1. So my resultant would actually be over here, this is my resultant, do you agree? So they want to say calculate the net electrostatic force, so that's what we want. But the first thing we need to do is work out that electrostatic force and that electrostatic force. So let's do it. Um, so we're gonna do the first one, Q1 and Q2, or Q2 and Q1, is F is equal to K, which is nine times by 10 to the nine, nine times by 10 to the nine, it's on your formula sheet. Q1 is two times by 10 to the negative five. So it's two times by 10 to the negative five. Q2 is two times by 10 to the negative four. You don't put the minuses and pluses in. That just tells us if it's attraction or repulsion. And the distance is 0, 0,5 squared. Okay, so let's work this out using our calculator. So we've got nine exponent nine, nine, multiplied by two exponent negative five, multiplied by two exponent negative four, all over 0 0.5 squared equals 144. So this is 144 newtons. Just a second. Yeah, I'm right. 144. 
Okay, so that's 144 newtons. That's quite big. Let me just check that I got that right. Um, let me just, oh, should it. Let's go back. Oh dear, I can't. That's very sad. Um, let's just go over there and delete. Delete, 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 and then see if I can go up. No, oh, no, I can't. Yay. I'm wondering if this did not put it. Okay, I'll just check. Um, let's just put a bracket around that. And a bracket around that. And let me just check. So we've got nine. Uh, let me just see. We've got two times by 10 to the negative four times by two times by 10 to the negative five. Nine times by 10 to the but negative four. I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be something. Let's go equals. It's still 144. Okay, it's 144 newtons. Fair enough. Okay, now let's do the down one. So we've got the force as 9 times by 10 to the 9 multiplied by 2 times by 10 to the negative 5. This is 2 times by 10 to the negative 4. But all that's different is this is 0, 4 squared. Okay, so let's go find our calculator. And then all we need to change is this number here to a 4. Delete. 4 equals and that is 225 so therefore this is going to be 144 and this is going to be 225 okay so now we need to find the resultant that's fairly easy to do so we can say 225 squared plus 144 squared equals and then we're going to square root the answer equals and that does not help me at all is 267.13 newtons so the resultant is 267,13 newtons so that is the resultant force 267,13 newtons but i'm not finished am i because we actually need to give a direction because they pointed that as north so we need to find this angle here at least so we can give it a bearing so we have that the adjacent side and we have the opposite side is 225 so do you agree that we can use tan to find this angle theta um so i can go tan of theta is opposite which is 225 over the adjacent which is 144 so i can go theta is equal to second function tan of 225 over 144 and guys why am i doing this because it's a vector so you need to get a direction so let us clear and then go shift tan fraction fraction two two five all divided by 144 bracket bracket equals 57.38 degrees so that little angle there is 57 comma 38 degrees so if we add that to 90 do you agree we're going to get a bearing of 147,38 degrees and there you go so the net electric static force is 266.67.13 newtons on a bearing of 147.38 degrees right now let's look at this it says a battery in a circuit represents um below has an emf of 12 so you can see that it's actually got all the um sorry just have a second it's got sorry i'm just checking this it seems to be a little bit yeah no it's fine okay it's got it's got an internal resistance okay so it's got an emf of 12 and it's got an internal resistance okay now it says of r it says voltmeter v1 is connected across the battery 
Okay, now it says the resistance of the connecting wires is negligible. The resistance of the connecting wires is negligible. Right, now switches S1 and S2 are both open. Right, write down the reading on the voltmeter V2. The reading on the voltmeter V2 is going to be what? Let's have a look at this. I just want to see something. It goes along, 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 along. It's still going to go through here. The voltmeter on V2, V2 is actually going to be the EMF, which is 12 volts. The reason being that if you look at this, while the circuit um, switches are closed, the current is going to go along here and along here. Then it's going to go along here. Then it goes through there. And oopsie, not there. And then through there and through there. So do you see that it is actually it's actually in series? The voltmeter is in series, is it not? It's in parallel with V1, but it's in series with the battery. Yeah, if, because it's in parallel with V1, I would say that it's actually going to be, yeah, no, it's the same thing. Yeah, that's fine. It's going to be measuring the EMF of the 12 volts. Um, these little resistors are so small compared to the resistance at 12 volts, it actually doesn't make much difference. So it would be approximately 12 volts, the EMF again, which is approximately 12 volts. Okay, so now let's just get rid of this. Now let's have a look at this. It says now switch S1 is closed and switch 2, reading on voltmeter V1 goes now goes down to 10 volts. So now we've got S1 closed. Obviously that goes down to zero because there's no potential difference between those two. But now the volts goes down to 10 volts. So that's the actual volt supply to the circuit. But at the moment, the circuit is now looking like this. So it's going la 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 la. S2 remains open, so it's going through all the resistors. Okay, and it's going along, yeah. Okay, right. Now, the question is, the very first question they ask is to calculate the total external resistance of the circuit. So do you see you've got two resistors that are in parallel here and one that's in series? So what we need to do is add these two in parallel first. So it becomes 1 over R total is equal to 1 over 10 plus 1 over 6. Common denominator of 60. Yeah, could be 30, but it doesn't matter. 10 goes into 66 times, plus 6 goes into 60 10 times. You're left with 16 over 60, which is 8 over 30, which is 4 over 15. Okay, but that's 1 over R parallel. So therefore, R parallel is going to be 15 divided by 4, which is going to be 3 fourths of 12. So it's 3 and 3 quarters, okay? Plus your 2 ohm resistor over there. So that is going to be 5,75 ohms ohms. So the total external resistance of the circuit is 5.75 ohms. Now they want the internal resistance of the battery. Okay, so we know that the EMF equals the volts to the circuit, okay, plus the volts lost, okay. And the last volts in this case happen to be equal to two volts, right? For the simple reason that this bit here is the 12 volts of the EMF and the 10 volts would actually go to the circuit. So the volts to the circuit is 10. In order to work out the internal resistance, we need to work out the current in the external circuit. So we're gonna go V is equal to IR which equals 10 is equal to I multiplied by 5 comma 75. Therefore, the current is equal to 
10 divided by 5 comma 75. Um, let's have a look. So it's 10. Clear. 10 divided by 5 comma 75 5 equals um, SD 1 comma 74. That's 1 comma 74 amps. Okay, so the current is 1 comma 74 amps as it is at the moment as the circuit is running. So therefore the internal resistance since the last volt is 2 volts. Okay, and we've got the current is 1 comma 74. We can say, let's just erase some stuff here. We can say, well, in that case, do you agree that V equals IR again, the volts is 2, the current is 1.74, so I can get the resistance by saying 2 divided by 1.74. Let me run that down to explain it to you a bit better. Okay, so I'm saying V equals IR again, Ohm's law. The volts that are lost, which are due to the internal resistance is 2. The current in the circuit is 1 comma 74, so I can find the internal resistance. R is going to be 2 divided by 1 comma 74. So if I do that, I go 2 divided by 1.74 equals, press the expand 1 comma 1 5. So the internal resistance, little r, is 1 comma 1 5 ohms. Hmm, nice question. Okay, now it says, now it says, the um, S1 and S2 are now closed. And it says S1 and S2 are now closed. So this is what's happening now. Now, instead, it's going along here. So it's cutting out this term resistor. So what has happened? Do you agree that the resistance has decreased? Okay. So it's how will the reading on the ammeter be affected? Choose any increase, decrease, and remain the same. Because the total resistance has decreased, what is going to happen to the current? The current's going to obviously be able to flow faster. So the current is going to increase. And why is that? Well, because the resistance has decreased. Okay. Right. Next question. Okay, so now we are doing electrodynamics. Question 9.1. Okay, first of all, it says we've got a generator. It tells you've got a generator, okay? There's a split ring commutator on it. It tells you there's a 20 ohm um, resistor, okay, on there for some reason. It's just resisting it, okay? Um, there is a split ring commutator. There's a magnet and there is a coil. And it says the coil rotates within the magnetic field, obviously. Okay, write down the type of current, AC or DC, induced in the coil. And then passing through the 20 ohm resistor. Okay, so remember that there was a thing about generators being either AC or DC, depending on whether they had a split ring commutator or sip rings, okay? Um, so, what is this, okay? First of all, they're telling you that it's a commutator, okay? It's a split ring commutator. So, the split ring commutator is a direct current um, generator. It produces direct current. So, passing through the 20 ohm resistor is your direct current, definitely, okay? And the reason is that the split ring actually allows for the transfer, the change in the current the whole way through, okay? So although there is an AC current inside the generator, okay, the split ring commutator converts the AC current that's being generated inside the coil to DC because what it does is it allows the, the, the coil to move to the correct carbon brush so it continues going in the same direction the whole way on the external circuit. Okay, 
that is why you put the slit drink commutator in. Okay, now an AC generator is used in the commercial production of electricity. Said one fundamental difference in construction between the AC generator and the DC generator. The AC generator uses slip rings, slip rings, whereas a DC generator uses slit drink commutators. It says fully explain why AC is preferred to DC for transmission of electricity. Okay, fine. In order for you to transfer electricity over long distance, we need to pre reduce attenuation. In other words, we need to reduce the loss of electricity over a long distance, right? So what you need to understand by that is that means that we need to have a very high voltage because, okay, the reason that we lose electricity over a long distance is because of friction. So the greater the rate at which the, um, so we've got V is equal to IR, right? Or we can say V over I is equal to R. So what you need to understand is that resistance is caused by the rate at which the, well, some of the resistance is caused by the rate at which the, the electricity is flowing so we want to reduce the current and if we reduce the current we need to increase the voltage okay so the way we do that is with what is called uh, transformers and transformers can only work with a c voltage so the only way we can transfer transfer or transport electricity over long distances is by doing it with a very high voltage. So what we do is we use step up transformers that transform the um, voltage, which then gets trans, I mean the current, I mean the, yeah, the volts, which then gets transported through the wires over very long distances. And then we use step down generators which then gets the voltage back to about 220 between 220 and 325 as it comes through to our house now these transformers can only work if we have ac current and that is why we need ac current right the diagram below shows the output of an ac generator a 20 ohm resistor is connected in the circuit thank you for sharing okay now it's oh that's why we need it this is calculate the frequency of the power source Okay, so this year is telling us the whole circuit, the whole period of the thing is 0,02 seconds. So we know that frequency is 1 over period. So the frequency is going to be 1 divided by 0,02. And if we flip that over, so we're going to go 1, 1, sorry, delete, delete, divided by 0.02. To the frequency is 50 hertz, which is kind of what we expected because that's the frequency we generally use on our appliances. Now it says the average power dissipated for the resistor. Okay, now the thing is, there is a formula that we can use. Okay, and the formula is to do with your root mean square power and your um, I max power. Okay, so let us think about that for a second. Um, you know that the power P average, okay, wait, um, P average equals I root mean square V root mean square. Okay, so now we need to think about what we have here. It, um, okay, so Okay, so your root mean square voltage, how do we get it? Okay, the root mean square calculation goes like this. V root mean square is equal to what? The root mean square voltage is equal to V max divided by root two. Okay, do you agree? And we have Vmax. We've got the Vmax. It is 
200. But they've also told us that we've got a 20 ohm resistor here. And that is because P is equal to um, VI, okay? But we know that V is equal to IR. So therefore, it could also be given that it is, therefore, I is equal to V over R. Do you agree? So therefore, we could say that this is equal to V squared over R. And they want the average power. So if we used P is equal to V root mean square squared over R, we would get the power. Do you agree? But V root mean squared is the same as V max over root 2. So what we can do is first work out what the V root mean square is, and then we can square it and then divide by the 20 ohm resistor and we'll get the power. So let's do that. Let's go. V root mean square is equal to 200 divided by root 2. Okay, let's get our calculator out. So it's 200 divided by root root 2 equals 141.42. So V root mean square is 141,42 4, 2 volts. But now what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to square that. So we're going to go 141,42. We're going to square it and divide it by the 20 ohms. And that is going to give us our average power dissipated by the resistor. So we're going to square this. And we're going to divide it by 20. And it gives me 1,000 1, watts. Because remember, power is measured in watts. Hmm, nice question. Hey. Right, now the photoelectric effect. Okay. Incident light of different wavelengths shown on a shone, 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 shone on a metal cathode in an evacuated tube as shown in the diagram below. So here's our incident light. This is the cathode and this is the anode, okay? And we've got a micrometer here, please note, a microammeter. It says it is found that light of 500 nanometers releases electrons. So first of all, what is a nanometer? Nanometer is 10 to the minus 9. So that is 500 times by 10 to the negative 9 meters releases electrons. So that is the wavelength of your light with the right incident. Okay, frequency. The microammeter gives a zero reading. So that just matches the work function. Just, just, just matches the work function. So the first question they ask us is define the term work function. And again, grade 12, I have to stress, go look at your exam guidelines. It'll tell you exactly word for word the definition you should say. But basically work function is a minimum energy required for a photon. Um, to cause an electron to be emitted from a surface. Then it says calculate the work function of the metal used in the cathode. Okay. So now we know that A equals HF. Okay. That is a Planck's constant times F, and that would also the work function is equal to HF0. But we haven't been given F0, we've been given the frequency. But we know that C is equal to lambda frequency. We know that C is equal to lambda frequency. Lambda is the wavelength, F is your frequency, and C is the speed of light. So do you agree that I can go, well, frequency is equal to C over lambda? And that's as far as we're going for today. We will continue with this tomorrow in tomorrow's lesson. I hope you have a great evening. Cheers.